You know, last week, uh, Steve Bain came up here and gave us an introduction to 1 John uh, and the series that we are, um, I guess, on the journey uh, to. It is a wonderful book. It is a book that is filled with love. Because one of the main things that John wants us to understand in his book is that God loves us and he wants to have a fellowship with us. You know, um, yesterday I went to the uh, Honda Center. I uh, went to the Lakers game, their first preseason. I'm a big uh, Lakers fan since the 80s. So it's been a while. You know, I've, I'm used to the whole uh, championships, playoffs, and all that stuff. So the last few years have been pretty bad. Where uh, this is the first time that I actually not watched on purpose. Because I didn't want to watch my favorite team uh, lose so much. But there's some excitement uh, this year. So my wife um, bought tickets for their preseason game for my birthday. Uh, and so we went. And um, it was exciting. Uh, it was filled. It was actually, wasn't filled. It was like half full when it actually started. But, you know, after a few more minutes, uh, more people came and came and came. And it was, it was pretty full. And it was kind of exciting to be in a place where there's thousands of people. And they're there for a purpose. And the purpose is to cheer on their team that they love. Uh, and and it's, it's fun. Uh, and it's, you know, it's awesome being part of a group that you all, there's something in common. But during about the middle of the game, and I'm not sure exactly when it was, but I think it was towards the middle, um, I, I, there was a, a, a jolt of joy that I felt. And it wasn't because it was a play, and I don't think they played really well, but anyways. Um, but on, on the big screen, uh, you know they have a big screen, and they have these times during halftime, or doing these uh, timeouts, uh, they have these people that, you know, the camera focuses on. Sometimes there's a kiss cam, sometimes a dance. It's, you know, all these type of things. Uh, and all of a sudden, as we were just watching, I was there with my family. Um, I, I saw somebody on that big screen that we recognized. And we're like, we looked at each other. Hey, is that that person? Go, oh, yeah, it is. Right? I'm not going to say who it was. And, and that person was going all crazy. You know, look, I didn't wanna, but it was somebody from <laughs> Living Hope. It was somebody from Living Hope, and I could see the joy from that person. Uh, later I found out she was with uh, a bunch of other people, and I didn't know that because I just saw the joy there, <laughs> and I just saw uh, her there. But anyways, that it brought a jolt of joy, and here's the reason why. It's because she, or that person, or she, okay, that person goes to my church. Um, and there was an immediate connection even if that person was just somebody that I just said hi to, or if it was just somebody that I, you know, you know talked to and, and visited, it didn't matter. The fact that I saw somebody from my church gave me a, a, a jolt of joy because there is something that, is, that I have a connection with in that person. And even more than that, it was a bolt of joy that this person was a believer, a believer who I worship with every single week. And like I said, it, it wasn't, you know, like, you know, this, or, you know, these people are uh, people that I talk with every single day. But there is something about being a Christian. And it's, there's something about talking to a Christian rather than just a somebody that you know from work, somebody that you know uh, as just a friend, a high school friend. But the fact that they believe, the fact that you believe, the fact that we both put our trust in the Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ, there's a sense of unity. There's a sense of what John calls fellowship. You know, I could, today, I could, I, I was debating it, not just a little bit, but I was going to make this the shortest sermon ever at Living Hope. I was going to. I was debating for like, you know, point one, you know, but I, I, I said, no, I can't do that. Because here is John's point in this passage. John's point is this. God desires fellowship with us. I can say amen to that and just walk away. Because that is the greatest truth that I can tell you. Today, that God Almighty desires fellowship with you, 
with me, with us. It's a mind-blowing thing once you think about who he is, but also when you think about who you are. Now, unbelievers may mock this. People who don't believe, I remember watching a, a comedian, uh, he's a known, um, you know, religious hater. Uh, he doesn't like any religion. And I remember in, in his show, uh, in the panel there, uh, he was just mocking believers because he was mocking the, the, the Christian uh, athletes who would pray uh, together before games or after games. And he was just mocking them and saying, you know, do you really think that God, if there is a God, that God would even care if you win or not? You think God would care, you know, that he would be for this team versus another team? And he was just mocking. And as I was watching them, my simple answer, and I was sitting there, goes, and if I was in that panel, I would say, oh, yeah, I do think he cares. Because he does. He wants to have a fellowship with us. He cares so much about us that he cares about the, every detail of our lives, everything that we do. Yes, he cares when we pray. Yes, he cares when we get hurt. Yes, he cares when we get, he cares about us. And that's what John is trying to convey uh, to his children. Look at the uh, passage, 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. It, says, it reads this way. It says, this is the message that we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. And here is the key verse here, verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. I want to just read that. I want to read verses 8 and 9, 10, but I want to read that, and I want that to really soak in uh, with everyone. Verse 7, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. You know, one of the reasons why uh, I can't just stop my sermon and message and say, you know, God wants a fellowship with you and just say amen and sit down is because we know this, but sometimes we don't feel it. Um, we know that this is the truth. We have learned, if we have been at church, we have learned that Jesus loves us. We have learned that God wants us to be with him. He desires that we follow his commandments. We have all these things. But a lot of times in our lives, we just don't feel it. We feel that God is far away, not close. We feel at times that God is mad at us rather than loving us. And so that's why I can't stop with just saying God desires a fellowship with us and that should be enough. But even in my own life, there have been times when I feel that God is so far away that, you know, is he ever going to come back? And John speaks to that. John speaks to people who feel like fellowship is broken. You know, he's, he does it by speaking against uh, heretics. But I, I believe he's not really speaking to the heretics. He's speaking to his children as you will, you know, hear and read about later. And that's how John describes his audience, his, his beloved children. And he wants them to know that God, yes, desires a fellowship with you. But if you don't feel him, if you don't have that good fellowship with him and you don't think you have, John has the formula, John has the truth that can restore that fellowship with him. And he starts with God. In verse 5, it says, this is a message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you that God is light and him there is no darkness. John begins with God. When he's talking about fellowship, 
uh, with God and, and, and us. He doesn't start with us and what we need to do. He starts with God. God is the one that initiates. God is the one that acts. God is the one that says, let there be light. God is the one that comes down. He is the bold one. You know, we think of bravery as, as sometimes people, you know, who, who come to faith in, in difficult times. And that's, that's brave. But the bold one, the one that takes the greatest risk, in one sense, is God, I think. God is the one that makes everything possible. We cannot force our fellowship with him. We cannot say, God, can you be my friend? And we can't do, we can do anything, we can do everything and everything, anything, yet we cannot be friends with God. We cannot fellowship with God unless God acts. So John begins with God. And, and he, he the, the unique thing, he says, he, he begins with God. And the reason why is because, I believe, because he experienced it. You know, he has the historical record. He was there when Jesus came. He was one of the first disciples. He was there when he died. And he was there when he resurrected. And we learned a little bit about that in 1 John 1 through, 1 through 4. He said, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, he says, you know, with my eyes, you know, which we looked upon, have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. He's telling these people, I have seen God come. I have touched him. I have seen him. I have experienced him. And so it was a historical fact. He says, we saw him come down. We saw him initiate this relationship that he wants with us. But he also experiences subjectively in his own life. He wasn't just there seeing God coming down and him acting. But it's more of he's experienced God coming to him. It wasn't something that he read about or he saw in a movie. But it is God incarnate coming to him. And we see that in Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 22, in the calling of the disciples. It says, while walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. So he saw God initiate something with, with Simon Peter. And, then, and going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. And this is the apostle John. In a boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat. And their father and followed him. See, it, it was a historical fact for him, but it was also something personal. God came to him directly and says, hey, you, come and follow me. And one of the, the you know, the, the awesome thing is you read the book of John, uh, his, his book, his um, gospel. He never refers to. Uh, himself, and, and when, whenever he appears in his book, he never says John, but he always refers to himself as the beloved. So when you, if you read the book of John, whenever it says the beloved, the loved one, the one whom Jesus loves, that's who he's referring to himself. See, this is not some doctrine that he's just trying to teach here. This is something he experienced. Where he himself says, whenever I refer to myself, what describes me is that I'm loved by God. I'm loved by Jesus. And this is the fellowship that he had with Jesus and God. And this is what he wants for those who believe. For those who do not believe, he is saying, this is what you can have. If you want love, if you want your joy to be complete can have that. You can have God's love. You can have this fellowship with him. And so what do we call ourselves as we think about, as we continue with on this passage? Do we call ourselves the one who have fellowship with God? The one who, um, you know, is beloved of God? Or does God seem so far away that our fellowship with him seems nothing? You know, I, uh, it's funny, um, I I went to uh, uh, this uh, soup plantation with, with my family, and uh, we were there, and we were eating. And, um, 
I, I walked away a little bit because I had to go get something for my car. And I saw, I saw somebody coming, and I made a connection because I know, I, I know this guy, right? And so I, I didn't say hi, but he said, hey, what's up? So I said, hey, you know, how you doing? And he had two uh, daughters. And I, I said hi to them, went to my car, went back in. Um, and he goes, hey, I just saw somebody from Living Hope. Uh, I, I saw somebody from Living Hope. I said, like, who was it? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know their name. But it gets worse, okay? Because I thought their kids were, oh, they were in, one was in KKC. I thought one was in Catapult. So I was like, Jonathan, hey, I saw this, you know, do you know the name of this person? And, as, as, and then my wife uh, walked and saw the person, right? And, yeah, that person wasn't from Living Hope. <laughs> he looked like someone from Living Hope. Uh, my age, had kids. Uh, but he was actually a, a person that we knew before in, in school, in the school setting. But I just assumed, because, yeah, anyway, anyways, it was bad because I thought he was from, he was from Living Hope. And I was going to, hey, how was, you know, how was church? And all that stuff, I was going to make that conversation with him. You see, we have, we, we have sometimes to have this fellowship sometimes with God like that. You know, God is there. Because, okay, you know, he's God, God, hey, hi, God, hi, God, how are you doing? And then we make these uh, general just acquaintances with God. Acquaintance with God, and he is kind of out of the picture. And then once in a while, he'll pop up and goes, hey, hey, God, how are you doing? And then we talk, and then he goes out of our picture. Then something comes into our life, and for something, we get confused, and we treat that thing as God. And this is what I mean by that. God is a figure that gives us certain things. And therefore, because he gives us certain things, we feel like we are close to him. We have fellowship with him. We don't really know him. And then when something else pops up and gives us that same thing, goes, oh, oh yeah, that's God. That's the thing that gives me, gives me love, so that must be God. So we didn't really truly know him. We just kind of expected something from him. And that's kind of our relationship with God. And I think that's what he is getting here. When he says, there are certain people who think that they have real fellowship with God. But yet, they walk in the darkness. Well, those people, you actually really don't have fellowship with God. John is being, being very clear about this. He says, if you walk in the darkness, then you don't have fellowship with God. You may think you have fellowship with God. You may come to church and says, I have fellowship with God because I come to church here. Because the church gives me certain things, God gives me certain things, and I take and I take and I take. And that's kind of my relationship with God. As soon as God, something else replaces that and I take from that person, that person becomes my God. I'll still come to church. But the thing is, for those people, John is saying, you actually don't have fellowship with God. Because you can't walk in the dark and still have fellowship with God. John Piper makes this this analogy by what it means by walking in the dark. He says this, he says, if you're in a dark room and you're kind of feeling for something, he says, if you touch this, it's a furry type of thing, like furry, furry it seems like a, like a, like, you know, like a pet, uh, and it's soft, and you touch, and another sign, he says, you touch, and it's, it's, it's sharp, and it's, it's rigid, and you're, you're touching, and you go, oh, which one feels better? Which one should I grab and hug? This sharp thing that could hurt me or this furry thing, this furry that has nice. So it says most people go and, and, and hug that and, and pick that up. And, and they hug it. And when the light turns on, what he says is when the light, sh you know, shines bright, that furry little thing is this monster with big, huge teeth that's ready to devour you. And on the other side, this, this sharp thing, this thing was a sword was a sword that you needed to pick up to go kill that monster. See, he says, if you're walking in darkness, you want comfort, you want, you know, soft things, you want something that will give you joy, you're not going to go reach the, the sharp edge, something that could hurt you, but you reach for this, and you're walking in darkness. But once God's light shines forth, you realize that the soft thing that you wanted and that you wanted to hold, it's the thing that could kill you. And the thing, the sword, is the thing that can help you 
kill that monster. So this is what these people were doing. They were walking in darkness. They didn't really need God. They didn't really need God. They just wanted things from God, comfort, joy, peace, things like that. Therefore, they felt that because God gave these things and they had these things, that they actually had fellowship with God. And John is saying, no, the only way that you can have fellowship with God is if you walk in the light as he is in the light. See, what does it mean for John to say, okay, if, if you really want this fellowship, what it means is you need to walk in the light, not walk in the darkness. What does he mean? Well, if you look at certain passages in the book of John, like verse 6 from this passage, if we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not live according to the truth. So he equates this light with truth. So when he says, if you walk in the light, then you will have fellowship with God and with others. What he is actually saying is, if we walk, if we have, if we walk in the truth, then you will have fellowship with God. Now, if you look at the Old Testament, light is also this holiness, this purity from God. Uh, and, and it's this, this bright light that God shines uh, and exposes everyone. It says, I'm the only one who is holy. No one else is. But the thing is, we can equate this truth and light together. Because truth by itself is useless in terms of the, in terms of, uh, the biblical way of thinking. Truth, if there's no ought behind the truth, then it's useless. And what the Bible tells us is, because combine this light with truth and holiness, is this. Is that if we walk in the truth... That truth will affect our lives. And so what John is saying is this. He's saying to walk in the light means to have God's light expose everything so that you can see everything the way God sees it. And the way you live your life is through God's eyes. And that's what it means to walk in the light. It means what does God love? If he loves the lost, then you need to love the lost. If he hates sin, then you need to hate sin. What it means is that your whole life is controlled by God's truth. You know, this passage um, is very simple but yet very difficult. And I was struggling a little bit which direction I wanted to go uh, in this passage. And I was talking to my wife. And I'll say, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm right there, but I don't know exactly, you know, which direction I want to go. You know what she said in a very rebuking and humbling way? She said, well, what's more biblical? <laughs> and I go, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I should probably go that way. And does that direct our lives? Does God's light, God's truth direct our lives? When we're at school... And we're tempted to cheat. We're tempted to, to, to trample over other people so that we can go get ahead. Are we living by the truth? If we're at home, do we cheat on our taxes? Do we, do we um, you know, lie a little bit about our feelings towards people? Do we treat our kids as prizes something that gives us joy rather than us loving them. There are all these implications of how we think that we're doing something good, yet God's light exposes all of that. God's word exposes all of that. That's why God's word is described as this double-edged sword. You know, sometimes we love the thing that, I mean, that maybe that's the reason why we refuse or we don't want to walk in the light. Because, you know, the light exposes everything, but the greatest thing that it exposes is our own sin. You know, I had a funny discussion, a real short, funny discussion with my, my son, Ethan. We have many of those. And, and, but I had this one little quick thing, and he said, are we going to church this Sunday? Yes, of course we are. <laughs> Why? Why? And he was really scared to come to church. I go, What's wrong? Why, why do you, you know, he never does this, right? He never does this. He says, yeah, I don't want to go to church today. 
or uh, this week, uh, can I, can we do something? I go, no, we're going to church. I got to preach. So you, you're going you're gonna to come to church. And, I, and so I probed a little further. And basically, he didn't want to come to church. And sorry, KKC, because he didn't want to come because today is a birthday, birthday thing. And he was so scared that he, was, he had to go up to the stage because they call all the birthday people up to the stage and they asked him questions. <laughs> so like we're preparing right now. We were preparing. So when you go up there, they're going to ask you, what's your favorite food? So we're trying to figure out answers. And, you know, Jonathan and I, we're trying to, you know, trying to mess him up a little bit. And he says, yeah, say banana cream. So, he <laughs> said, you know, say banana cream. He goes, what's your favorite movie? He goes, say Cinderella. So we're trying to... <laughs> <laughs> we, were, we were making fun of him, but he was actually literally scared. Not, I don't want to say scared. Don't, please don't tell him, okay? <laughs> but he, he didn't want to know. Um, I mean, he didn't want to get up there. Uh, and I said, okay, how about if I just, you go to Sunday school and I just take you out of words. He was so happy. But I said, no, you can't do that. You go in there, be a man, <laughs> and then stand up there and answer the questions correctly, all right? So, uh, but he was so scared being up here on a stage, being exposed, being asked questions. And that's kind of what the Bible does. It only, not only it lights the path and where you want to go and what you should do, what God's will is. The greatest thing, I think, that the, the hardest thing that the Bible does in walking in the light is that you get exposed. You get exposed as a sinner you are. Your thoughts get exposed. Your hypocrisy gets exposed. And we don't want that. So a lot of times we don't want to walk in the truth. We don't want to be guided by God. We don't even want to read God's word at times because of what it could say about us. Are you there right now? Are you there where you are so scared to be exposed by God's truth that you refuse to walk in the light, that you, your sin... It's so hidden sometimes that you almost forget about it or treat it as it's nothing. John is saying, walk in the light. Don't walk in the darkness. Expose your sin to God. Because that is the only hope of restoration for the fellowship. That is the only way that your fellowship with God can be restored. If you feel so far away from God that God is way out there and you're wondering, God, why are you there? Why aren't you helping me? Expose the light of God's truth upon your heart. And John says, confess your sins. There were some people that when he was speaking to says that we have not sinned. We don't sin. There's nothing to expose. And just as I read that, I just, it's like almost laughable that people would say something like that. That I don't sin. If I spend an hour, 30 minutes, I can probably point out some sins that you just, you know, committed. And you can point out the sin that, that I've committed. It's ridiculous. It's nonsensical to say that we do not sin or we have not sinned. We are our nature, we're born with original sin. And John is pointing out that that is the truth. That is the reality. And that's what God's light exposes. The only recourse, the only way, the only solution is to be honest with God and confess your sin. Verse 9, if we confess our sin, he says, confess your sin. And then he promises this. He says, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See, that's the part that sometimes we do not uh, know or we refuse to. We need to walk through that path of confessing our sins, exposing ourselves to the light. And then there is this joy John says that he is faithful we sang about God's faithfulness today 
and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That is the only path to having fellowship with God. It is not what we can do. It is not how many times we come to church. It is not how much we serve God. Those are all good. But those will not restore our fellowship with God. John says, the thing that will restore the fellowship is our sins being eradicated from us. For the blood of Jesus to take away that sin. And that is the only thing that will restore our fellowship with God. You know, we we fight this battle so much because we want this so bad. We, We want God to love us so much. We want what John experienced probably every single day. He calls himself the beloved that Jesus loves. We want that. That's what we want as believers. Even as unbelievers, that's what they want. But yet we refuse because we are so scared of what God might think when we expose our sin. Here's the difference. Because that same fear will keep us from confessing our sins to each other. That same fear, because we don't know what that person will say. We don't know what that person, how they'll re- react to our sins, especially if we committed it against them. Are they going to get angry? Are they going to take revenge? And so as, as, as even just human beings, we don't want to do that. We want to kind of shy away from that because they're so unpredictable. And yes, one person might say, that's okay, I love you, I want to forgive you, and you know, hug you. And we might get that other time. They will never talk to you again. So we're fearful of exposing our sins to one another. But here's the difference with God. He's already told you what he would say. He's already told you what he will do. He says, if you're sincere, you confess your sins, any sin, I will forgive you. I will cleanse you of all righteousness. I will embrace you, and I will call you mine, and you will have fellowship with me. He has promised that to us. He is not an unpredictable God. It's, it's not unknown what he will do if we confess our sins. Brothers and sisters in Christ, confess your sins to God. And the blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse you. And your fellowship with God will be restored. And you can be like John and thousands of others, millions of others, who have said, I confess my sins to God. And he has forgiven me. And now I'm restored. And now my joy is complete. Because isn't that how he started? He says, I'm, I'm, I write these things to you. I this fellowship with God. And he says in verse 4, and we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Our joy is complete when our fellowship with God is restored and the only path is the confessing of our sins. Let's bow our heads and pray.